Hi everybody, and welcome to the second part of the Chapter 11 lecture, where we will continue discussing evolution and, in particular, in this part, its processes. In this first part of the lecture, we defined evolution as the fact that populations of organisms change over time, becoming genetically different from their ancestors. In this part of the lecture, we are going to be asking the question of what drives evolution, or in other words, why does this happen? Before we start talking about the forces that cause evolution to occur, it's important that we realize that variation is essentially the raw material of evolution. And without genetically based variation, evolution would not be able to occur because as we've learned, evolution is simply a shift in the genetics of a population from one form to another. And if populations shift to become different from their ancestors, that shift is based on a change in their genetics, which produces new variants of, for example, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, or new variants of humans that have six fingers and six toes. If every organism in a population was genetically identical across every generation, then evolution would not be possible because evolution is based upon change. So where does this genetic variation come from? Well, there are two sources of genetic variation. One of them is mutations. We've talked about mutations previously in the class. These are changes to the genetic code which can lead to new variations of characteristics. One example of a mutation that has occurred in a familiar species is uh, a mutation that is called achondroplastic dwarfism. It's a random genetic mutation that causes normally proportioned torsos, but relative to the torso, small limbs. This type of dwarfism actually occurs in humans as well. And this new genetic variation surfaced in dogs about 300 years ago. People latched onto it. They thought that it looked cute. And they decided to create entire breeds of dogs, such as the corgi that you see on the screen right here, um, that express this mutation. And this brings us to our second way that genetic variation is created, and that's through sexual reproduction. We've learned that sexual reproduction involves two partners creating genetic offspring um, by each contributing half of the genetics to those offspring. And it turns out that the mutation for achondroplastic dwarfism can be introduced to other breeds of dogs by crossing them with uh, breeds such as corgis. What you see in this image right here is a series of photos representing an experiment that was carried out in 1941 where um, not a corgi, but another type of dog that expresses achondroplastic dwarfism, which is the Basset Hound, was crossed with a German Shepherd, and the resulting offspring expressed the achondroplastic dwarfism mutation, and this represents new genetic variation upon either of the two parents that were a part of this cross. Now, um, I've actually linked an article here that explains a little bit about this mutation in dogs and why it is the case that crossing dogs like corgis with other dogs uh, results in the same sort of dwarfism because of this mutation. Um, so let's say that a corgi shepherd mix is born with a chondroplastic dwarfism. Does that mean that this individual organism has therefore evolved? Well, the answer is no. And the reason why gets back to the definition of evolution itself. Remember that evolution is defined as populations of organisms changing over time, becoming genetically different from their ancestors. An individual mutation happening in one organism does not constitute evolution. What evolution really is, is large scale changes in the genetic composition of entire populations over many generations and long periods of time. Individual organisms do not evolve. A better question to ask would not be, did this individual dog evolve? But rather, if we think about 400 years ago, what percentage of dogs across the world had that achondroplastic dwarfism mutation? 0.1%. 
This was before humans discovered it and latched onto it. And so if you counted up every dog on Earth 400 years ago, and you quantified what percentage of them had this mutation, it would be extremely low. If you think about today, however, a huge variety of different dog breeds have this mutation, and a very high percentage of the dogs on Earth express it. This means that the genetic composition of the dog as a species has shifted to favor achondroplastic dwarfism because of human intervention. So the bottom line here is that individuals do not evolve, populations do. The first dog that ever had achondroplastic dwarfism and that was picked out by humans as being a cute dog that we should breed things with, that dog did not evolve. But over the past 300 years, over many generations and many dog breeds, we can see that the domestic dog is evolving. So we are going to talk about a few different forces that drive evolutionary change. And we're going to start with natural selection, which is perhaps the most important and the most relevant of them all before moving on to the other three. Natural selection is defined as the more successful reproduction of individuals possessing traits that allow them to survive better in their environment. Understanding natural selection is actually pretty easy if you have an understanding of an analogous concept that we've just mentioned called artificial selection. Artificial selection, which is also known as selective breeding, is the process of humans choosing to breed individual organisms that they have decided have desirable traits, such as achondroplastic dwarfism in dogs. Now, all domesticated dogs are descendant from a wolf species that is their ancestor. But today, most dog breeds share few traits, externally at least, that are in common with the wolf. The reason why we see the variety of dog breeds that we see today is because of this process of artificial selection, where certain organisms were chosen because of their desirable traits, such as, for example, the thick coat and the large stature and strength of the St. Bernard dog, um, which what made it a suitable species for rescuing um, mountaineers in the snowy St. Bernard Mountain Pass in Europe. Um, humans, at one point in time, chose the dogs that had the most desirable forms of these traits and bred them together over and over again until they could achieve a dog that had, um, essentially, the best set of traits for the purpose that they had laid out for it. Other dogs, the case is similar. But what you may not know is that this has also been done in other species, and it has been done in our lifetimes. So um, we're going to take a moment and watch this video about the domestication of foxes through selective breeding or artificial selection and see exactly how the process works. We're visiting Amy and David Bassett at their Canid Education and Conservation Center. It's sort of an interactive zoo built to introduce the general public to foxes. The Bassetts got them as pets, but not from an exotic pet breeder. They're the result of a nearly 60-year-long Russian science experiment. Victor, sit. Sit. Good fox. Good fox. It all traces back to a Soviet geneticist named Dmitry Belyaev. In the 1950s, Belyaev hit on an idea that was radical for its time that domesticated animals, like dogs, are friendly to people because of genes that govern their behavior. Meaning, the process that turned wolves into dogs tens of thousands of years ago was essentially evolution. There were friendliness genes that won out in wolves as they adapted to live alongside humans. These foxes exist because of the way Belyaev tested his idea. In 1959, his team began selectively breeding foxes at the Institute of Cytology and Genetics in remote Novosibirsk, Russia. The criterion was simple. The foxes that showed the least fear or aggression when approached by experimenters were allowed to breed. The less friendly foxes weren't. They selected the next generation of foxes the same way, and the next generation, and the next, for decades. 
Belyaev died in 1985, but the work continued. And by 2004, nearly 70% of the foxes had reached an elite level of friendliness. By some measures, they had domesticated the fox. Which is how, a few years back, two dog lovers found themselves in over their heads. We had, yeah, we had absolutely no idea. They're very cheeky, very mischievous, get into everything, chew and tear everything apart. David and Amy currently own five of the only 10 or 15 Belyaya foxes in the United States. It cost around $9,000 to buy and import one all the way from Siberia. And they came with a learning curve. We learned quickly that they're not really house trained, so they will poop and pee everywhere. Um, so it's not very easy to have them in your kitchen, say, when they jump on the counters and poop. The Bassets have since adjusted to life with foxes, but they've learned that being domesticated is one thing, being man's best friend is another. While they are certainly tame, they're fascinating and incredible animals, they're still foxes. And when you domesticate a fox, you don't make a dog. You make a domesticated fox any more than when you domesticate a horse, you make a dog. So Belyaev did not recreate the dog. But for anyone studying how wolves evolved into dogs, the foxes might still represent a behavioral stepping stone. They're on a path to doghood, if you like. Clive Wynn is a professor of psychology at Arizona State. He studies the unique relationship between dogs and people, and the way that dogs go above and beyond simple friendliness towards humans. Dogs have this emotional availability, I sometimes call it hypersociability, that they are so very, very ready and willing to form emotional relationships. According to Clive, at least 14,000 years ago, hypersocial dogs emerged from a population of wild wolves. And no one's really sure how it happened. I mean, that is the million dollar question, and we don't exactly know. But the Belyaya foxes might offer a clue. Clive and his team have a simple test to okay. see how far along the foxes are on their path to doghood. And they told us how to carry it out. So the experiment is really simple. I have a one meter radius circle all the way around me, and they're gonna bring in a fox one at a time into this enclosure. The idea was to see how much of two minutes the foxes would spend inside my circle. We tried first with the three Belyaya foxes, and one by one, they trotted up, sniffed me, and then relaxed somewhere else. Which has been Clive's experience with the foxes too. They greet and they interact and then they move on. For comparison, we also tested a fox that was hand reared by humans, but genetically wild. It never set foot inside the radius and it never relaxed. And for a final contrast, we tested a dog. Two I gotta, I gotta ignore you for two minutes. <laughs> so I stopped that video short, um, but there are lots of videos on YouTube about the Belyaya foxes if you want to learn more and about how the experiment is still ongoing today. But hopefully it gives you a sense of how this process of artificial selection works and therefore a sense of how natural selection works because it turns out that natural selection works exactly the same way as artificial selection, except nature, instead of humans, choose which organisms get to breed. And nature chooses in the sense that whichever organisms have the greatest fitness are able to survive better and therefore have more opportunities to reproduce. And if they are reproducing more, then their representation in the next generation increases. We can see the effects of natural selection not only in domestic dog populations, but also in different breeds of wild dogs. Uh, for example, the coyote has a coat color that is particularly well adapted to its environment that allows it to camouflage itself. And the reason why it has this coat color is because coyotes that have the coat color are able to survive better, and therefore those are the ones that get to breed and reproduce, and their offspring are the ones that make up the future generations of the populations. Just like humans hand-picked which dogs uh, they wanted to breed in order to create the uh, breed that we now know as the St. Bernard, which was well suited for the particular purpose of rescuing people in the snow, the coyote has been picked by nature 
to be well suited for the purpose of camouflaging itself in its dry, deserty environment. The same goes for other breeds of wild dogs. We can see this in the dingo. We can see it in the Arctic wolf. We can see it in the African wild dog. And we can see it in the maned wolf. All of these different types of wild dogs have coat colors and general characteristics that make them well suited and well adapted to their environment because nature has quote unquote chosen them to be that way. Now we've started using this word fitness, so uh, we should elaborate a little bit more about what we mean when we're talking about fitness because this can be sort of a misunderstood concept. Fitness is determined by reproductive success of an organism or the number of offspring that it produces. It is not determined necessarily by how fast the organism is, how strong it is, how muscular it is, how smart it is. All of these things can play into fitness, certainly, but from an evolutionary biologist's perspective, the definition of fitness doesn't have to do with those things as much as it has to do with how many offspring the organism can produce. The fittest organism is the one that generates the highest number of offspring because that organism is the one that will go on to be more represented in the next generation by its offspring. With that in mind, we have a checkpoint here where I want you to tell me which of these two individuals would be considered fitter from an evolutionary biology perspective and why. So we have Bob and Billy. I want you to read their descriptions and tell me which of the two has a higher fitness. In addition to the term fitness, another term that you'll hear us using a lot is adaptation. Natural selection can lead to the evolution of adaptations, which are defined as an inheritable trait that helps an organism's survival and reproduction in its present environment. There are many adaptations that we can identify in the world of living organisms. For example, as we can see on the slide here, uh, we've got a desert hare, which has evolved these long, flat ears that allow it to basically release heat um, into the environment. Blood moves through the vessels in the ears and releases the body heat, which cools the hair, um, which is perfect for its hot desert environment. But if we think about how these ears would function and whether they would be effective in a different environment, such as um, right here, the environment of the Arctic hare, these ears would do nothing for this rabbit if you were to plop it down in a snowy, cold environment. As we can see, the Arctic hare, the native type of rabbit that lives in this environment, doesn't have ears like that at all. In fact, it has short stubby ears, which are adapted to its specific environment. So the message that I want to send to you guys here is that there are no objectively fit adaptations. Traits are only adaptive in relation to a specific environment. It is not objectively good for a rabbit to have long, flat ears like this. It's only good for the rabbit if it lives in the desert. And it is not objectively good as a rule for a hare to have short, stubby ears like this. It's only good if it lives in an Arctic environment. So what makes a trait adaptive and fit is defined in relation to the environment in which the organism lives. Here's another example. This little guy right here is a katydid, um, also known as a leaf bug, because as you can see, it camouflages itself to look like a leaf. And this is a very good adaptation for it to have if it lives in an environment where there are similar looking leaves. But imagine if you took this katydid and you dropped it in a pine tree forest or in the Sonoran Desert. Is its resemblance to a leaf going to do anything for it in those environments? No. Um, in that case, its carefully evolved adaptation is not going to be beneficial to it at all. And so we got to keep in mind that traits are not objectively good or bad. They're only good or fit in relation to a particular environment. So 
I want to give you a little exercise in this in the form of a checkpoint. Describe for me a set of environmental conditions wherein having a long pointy beak would be a beneficial adaptation for a bird and a set of conditions where it would not be a beneficial adaptation for a bird. And to give you some ideas as to how you might answer this checkpoint, I have a few animations here of different species of birds that do have long pointy beaks showing you what they use them for. So natural selection can have a few different effects on the range of variation that is seen within a population. In some circumstances, natural selection can favor an intermediate form of a trait and selects against the extreme forms at the different ranges of the variation. So essentially this picks and chooses the most medium form of the trait, the most intermediate form, and that's what becomes more prevalent and adaptive in the population. The opposite can also be true. This is called directional selection. Now the first one was called stabilizing selection for obvious reasons. It stabilizes the population and tends to make individuals all look the same. Directional selection uh, does the opposite where it favors uh, one form at the extreme end of a range of variation and it disfavors the uh, forms that are at the opposite range of variation. A great example of directional selection that happened in history um, was with the peppered moths in England during the Industrial Revolution. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, the uh, dominant form of the peppered moth was the one that you see on the left, where it has sort of a white speckly appearance. And this form of moth was favorable at that time because they were able to land on the bark of birch trees and camouflage themselves. However, after the Industrial Revolution began, the environment begot, uh, became a lot more polluted and um, the color on the surface of the trees and buildings changed from uh, being the white speckly color to this sooty black color. And so over time, the white peppered moths became less favorable because they actually stood out against the black pollution and the soot. And the rare moths that were born with this uh, solid black variation became more favorable. And therefore natural selection caused the direction of the variation to be favored um, towards the solid black moths. And that's why it's called directional selection. And then uh, last but not least, the third type is called diversifying selection. And diversifying selection is where the extreme forms of a range of variation are both favored and the intermediate forms are not favored. So something at one extreme range uh, does well, something at the other extreme range does well, but the things that are medium do not do well. Here's a checkpoint where I would like you to pick out which mode of natural selection is acting in this case. We're talking here about the black-bellied seed cracker, which is a type of bird that exhibits two forms, those with beaks that are 12 millimeters or less in width, and those with beaks that are 15 millimeters or more in width. You rarely see birds that have an intermediate or medium beak size. Almost always see birds that are small or large, but not the medium ones. Which of the three modes of selection from the last slide is exhibited in the black-bellied seed crackers? So that completes our discussion about natural selection. And now we're going to move on to the other causes of evolutionary change, because natural selection is only one of the ways in which organisms or populations can evolve. Populations can also evolve and change as a result of sexual selection, genetic drift, and gene flow.
So let's talk first about sexual selection. Sexual selection is the phenomenon by which organisms that are better at securing mates have more opportunities to reproduce and therefore pass on their genes. It's kind of like natural selection, the principles are the same, except instead of nature being the one that chooses which organisms get to survive and therefore reproduce, it is the individual organisms that get to choose this. Um, so, in other words, individuals that are more attractive within their species make more offspring and therefore become more represented in the next generation. They pass on their genes more. For example, it is well documented that female peacocks, which you can see on the left, will more often choose a mate that has brightly colored plumage um, which you can see in the background here. This is a female peacock in the front looking very plain, and in the back is a male peacock trying to impress her. It is also known that female stock-eyed flies, which is what you see right here, are known to prefer males that have the longest eye stalks. So something about the length of those eye stalks really does it for them. So uh, the most brightly colored peacocks and the Male stock-eyed flies with the longest stalks for their eyes get to reproduce more and therefore become more prevalent in the next generation. That's how sexual selection works. Next we have genetic drift. And genetic drift is defined as the alteration of a population's gene pool by the effect of chance. Because there's not always necessarily a rhyme or reason to the way that things evolve. Sometimes chance events can have a dramatic effect on the gene pool. And typically, populations that are small are much more susceptible to being significantly altered by these sorts of chance events. And this is especially true when these chance events have something to do with some sort of disaster. Uh, which kills off a significant portion of the population. There are two different common types of genetic drift that are recognized by biologists. The first one is called the bottleneck effect, and the second one is called the founder effect. So let's take a look at how each of these works. The bottleneck effect is defined as a dramatic shrinking of the gene pool due to a random event that wipes out a large portion of individuals in a population. It's called a bottleneck because, um, similar to the shape of a bottle, what happens is only a small amount of the population is able to get through to the other side of this catastrophic event, and then they are responsible for um, basically producing the future generations and being the gene pool from which all future organisms are drawn. One really well-documented example of the bottleneck effect occurred in elephant seals, which you can see right here on the slide. In the 1890s, uh, the entire world population of elephant seals was reduced to an estimated 20 individuals. And this was due to hunting by humans. Humans hunted elephant seals so prolifically in the mid to late 1800s that, that it is believed that there were only 20 elephant seals approximately left alive during that decade, the 1890s. Now, um, at, at that point, humans started to back off their hunting and the population recovered. And in fact, today, there are 30,000 elephant seals worldwide. But what this means is that all of those 30,000 elephant seals are the offspring of the 20 that survived the bottleneck catastrophe in their population. So 30,000 sprang from 20. And when their population was reduced that dramatically, a lot of the different variations and mutations that could have been beneficial to this population were lost because they were killed by hunters. So today's population has far less genetic variation compared to the population before the bottleneck because every elephant seal today comes from just 20 that survived it. The other type of genetic drift is called the founder effect. 
And the founder effect is described as a reduction in genetic variation within a new population founded by a small number of individuals that broke off from a larger population. So imagine that there's a main continent that uh, houses a wide variety of different butterflies, and maybe a few of them get blown off course onto a new island, and those ones become the colonizers of a new population. But as you can see, because just a few of them were blown off course to the new island, some of the genetic variation in the ancestral population is lost. Namely, the white butterflies are not represented on the new island because those ones, by random chance, didn't happen to comprise the group that got blown off course. Another example of the founder effect that we talked about at the beginning um, was the uh, Amish population and the disease Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, which causes dwarfism and polydactyly, six fingers, six toes. The reason why this disease is so prevalent in the old Amish order in Pennsylvania is because of the founder effect. One individual and his wife, who was carrying the disease, came over and helped found the new population. And because they were then the founders of all generations thereafter that uh, are living in the order, um, this means that their genes are more widely represented, and therefore it is much more common, about a thousand times more common, for this disease to be possessed by people in this population compared to the rest of the world. And this brings us to our fourth and final mode of evolutionary change, which is gene flow. Gene flow is described as the flow of alleles, or versions of genes, in and out of populations due to the migration of individuals, their gametes, such as pollen, or their genes. One example of gene flow that applies directly to humans is the flow of genes between humans and Neanderthals about 100,000 years ago. Humans today have been able to find Neanderthal remains and actually look at the DNA in them. Uh, and by analyzing the DNA found in these excavated Neanderthal remains, they can see that humans and Neanderthals actually interbred with each other when humans made the migratory move out of Africa 100,000 years ago. About 2% of the DNA of people who are not of sub-Saharan African origin comes from Neanderthals. So it is found that people who are not native to sub-Saharan Africa have approximately 2% Neanderthal DNA. The significance of having this Neanderthal DNA as a result of this interbreeding and gene flow event is that certain variations in skin color, hair color, especially red hair, um, are associated with Neanderthal DNA. Daytime napping, narcolepsy, and mood disorders have also been connected to this 2% Neanderthal DNA. So those are interesting facts. Here in another checkpoint, I want you to tell me which of the two populations would be more susceptible to the effects of genetic drift, the large population or the small population? And here I'd like you to identify the mode by which the population has evolved. So Sika deer, which you can see on the left, were introduced to Europe from Asia in the 19th century. Crossbreeding with the native red deer, right here, is producing a significant population of hybrids on the right, which have characteristics of both species. This is an example of evolution by which of the four mechanisms that we just talked about? Natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, or gene flow? So we have seen how through natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and sexual selection, populations of organisms can change and evolve over time. But another one of the questions that evolution seeks to answer is what is it that makes separate species emerge through these processes? The definition of a species 
in the field of evolutionary biology is that organisms that are able to mate with each other and produce viable, fertile offspring belong to the same species. So essentially what this means is if they can successfully reproduce together and their offspring are also able to reproduce, meaning they are fertile, then those two organisms are the same species. And if they can't do that, then they are separate species. For example, in the checkpoint that we just talked about, um, those two varieties of deer, the Sika deer on the left and the red deer on the right, they were actually able to interbreed with each other and produce a hybrid type of organism, meaning that these two would technically belong to the same species, just two different variations of that species. An example of two organisms that are not the same species are horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys are able to reproduce with each other, and when they reproduce with each other, the result is a mule. But mules are sterile. Mules cannot reproduce more mules. And so therefore, horses and donkeys are not considered to be the same species because when they re reproduce together, their offspring is essentially the end of their genetic lineage. They are not the same species. So the process of two populations of organisms evolving to the point where they are so different, where they can no longer reproduce and create viable fertile offspring, that process is called speciation. Speciation is something that occurs over a very long period of time. And I created a little graphic for you to demonstrate um, just the principles of how this might happen in something like horses and donkeys, which we know are separate species because they cannot breed together successfully. But we also know that based upon their genetics and based upon how similar they are anatomically as well as the fossil record, that horses and donkeys share a common ancestor, which means that they are cousins of each other even though they are not the same species. So here in this graphic, I have a figure, and this represents the common ancestor of modern horses and donkeys, which is thought to have existed about 4 million years ago. Now, in this graphic, every little equine figure is going to represent a wide variety of uh, different populations here. It's representing many generations because we're talking about a period of 4 million years that I'm showing here. So this one little figure is not actually one little equine organism. This is many generations of equine organisms shown here. So from that ancestral population, distinct populations can emerge, which may be separated from each other into different groups based upon migration, physical barriers, development of different environmental niches, meaning that they have different sorts of foods that they like to eat. And so from a single population, you can get a split into multiple different populations. Now over time, some of these populations may go extinct, others will persist, and others can further diverge and split into separate groups. As this process continues, wherein some populations go extinct, some persist, and some split, mutations will accumulate in these separate populations. And remember, mutations are these random changes in the genetic code, some of which are beneficial, and some of which will stick, and therefore get propagated throughout populations. That will then make these populations genetically distinct from their other related populations, or their cousins, as it were. The horses up here, or rather the equine species up here, are now genetically different from the ones down here, because maybe these uh, equine species live in the grasslands, maybe these ones live in the canyons, 
and they never interbreed with each other, but this group has developed a mutation that has changed its coat color, whereas this one has not. As the process continues, more mutations occur and accumulate, and the populations can become more and more different from each other, because remember, this is going on over millions of years, and if the populations stay separate, then eventually the mutations will build up and the populations will become so genetically divergent or distinct from each other that their DNA can just no longer mix. It's no longer compatible and they cannot interbreed. And that's how we get to a situation where horses and donkeys are separate species from each other, even though they come from a common ancestor. Genetic changes have built up and accumulated over the past four million years, which have made them no longer capable of interbreeding. Now, there are a few different mechanisms that can cause the populations to become isolated from each other uh, as these mutations accumulate. One of these is called temporal isolation. Temporal refers to time. And so temporal isolation is where two populations have adapted to two different breeding time periods, and therefore they will not intermix with each other in the wild. A great example of this is in cacti and cacti flowers. Most cacti flowers open during the day and close at night, but the saguaro has developed mutations which cause its flowers to open at night and close during the day. And what this means is that the saguaro cactus is reproductively isolated from other types of cacti and will not breed with them because its flowers are open at a different time compared to other cacti and therefore they will never cross-pollinate with each other. That is temporal isolation. Another type of isolation is called habitat isolation. Habitat isolation is where two populations have adapted to different habitats and therefore they will not interbreed in the wild. One example of this occurs in walking stick insects, which you can see in the image up here. Some of them have developed the predilection to live and feed on California lilacs while others live on chemise, which is what you see on the right. And so because these two populations live in essentially different bushes, although that might seem like we're splitting hairs here, um, they will never interact with each other because they have evolved uh, a preference for these different food sources and different habitats, and therefore they are reproductively isolated. Behavioral isolation is where two populations have evolved and adapted different mating rituals, which they do not find attractive across different groups. You can see this clearly across different species of birds. Um, we have up here the blue-footed booby, and down here we have the bower bird, both exhibiting their characteristic mating dances. And um, as you can imagine, the mating dance of the bowerbird would not be at all attractive to that of the blue-footed booby and vice versa. So therefore, these two groups of birds will not interbreed with each other. Mechanical isolation is where two populations have adapted different reproductive organs or structures that are actually not physically compatible for interbreeding. They have evolved mutations which cause their reproductive structures to not be able to fit or work with the reproductive structures of other similar species. So an example of this can be seen in two species of sage from California um, and in the way that they store their pollen. So the stamen of the flower is what holds up the anther and the anther is where the pollen is located. And as you can see on this species down here, um, there is a much longer stamen. And over here, there's a short stamen. So black sage, this one right here, has a very long stamen, 
and it has to be pollinated by a very large species of bee because a small bee, when it visits this flower, would not actually come into contact with the pollen. White sage over here has that short stamen and has to be pollinated by a small species of bee. And so the two do not interbreed because of this. And then finally, gametic isolation is where two populations have evolved incompatible gametes. Their reproductive cells, which include the sperm and the egg or the pollen and the ova, simply do not fertilize with each other. Great example of this can be seen in sea urchins. Sea urchins reproduce by simply uh, releasing their gametes out into open water. They simply just throw them out there and hope that they encounter another compatible gamete so they can fertilize. And although they may live in close proximity to each other, the giant purple sea urchin uh, and the red sea urchin will not interbreed even if their sperm and egg encounter one another because the two are not compatible with each other. The sperm of one simply cannot penetrate and fertilize the egg of another. We are going to finish this chapter off with a few checkpoints here. On this slide, I have two different varieties of toads. We've got Bufo americanus on the left and Bufo fowleri on the right. Bufo americanus mates in the late summer, while Bufo fowleri mates in the early summer. Which type of reproductive isolation is exhibited by these two species of toads? And lastly, the Mexican long-tongued bat pollinates both agaves and saguaros. Pollen may be carried between the two species, but the gametes of the agaves and the saguaros will never fertilize with each other. They're not compatible. Which type of reproductive isolation is exhibited here? 